Thanks. Thank, thank you, Magda. Um, so Dr. Bartka is a professor of sociology and head of school of the Global Studies Program at the University of Freiburg, Germany. She has a degree in English and German languages and literatures and a PhD in sociology. She was visiting professor at IUPEERJ Rio de Janeiro in 2007-2008. Um, University of Berlin from 2012 to 2015. She has published widely on world systems analysis, decolonial perspective, perspectives on global inequalities, gender and citizenship in modern modernity and coloniality, and the geopolitics of knowledge in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Alongside literary, literary scholar Anska Parvulescu, she recently co-authored Creolizing the Modern, Transylvania Across Empires, forthcoming in German and Romanian translation in 2023. Dr. Barker, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Phoebe, for the kind introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation to join this um, exciting forum. I've been following it um, since, well, since I first heard about it, um, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of this um, speaker series. And thank you all for making time on a Saturday, which I know is not um, the usual time slot here, uh, but I hope it will lead to kind of um, also more relaxed discussion. I'm really looking forward to this being a dialogue rather than just me um, kind of offering my own perspective and then kind of being the authoritative voice here. So um, what I want to do is uh, share a presentation first um, and then talk you through the uh, main points in the title so it's clear where I come from in both political and um, epistemic terms. So the title of the talk is Unthinkable Europeans in Unequal Europe's Defining Romani Europeans Out of Whiteness, this has to do a lot with um, a perspective from um, Europe, but a perspective from the excluded in Europe at the same time. Um, so bear with me here in uh, trying to relate the experience of racialized within Europe to other experiences of racialization across the world, uh, especially to the racialization of uh, enslaved people um, in the uh, transatlantic slave trade and the Afro descendant um, today. Unthinkable Europeans then in unequal Europe um, combines two of the themes that I've been working on for a while. The first is a typology of um, multiple and unequal Europe's rather than the idea that Europe as a monolith has produced multiple modernities that then um, spread across the world. And the idea of unthinkable Europeans has to do with um, the conflation of Europeanness and whiteness, which I think is an occidentalist fallacy, not only of social theory, but of social thought more generally and of both political and media discourse in recent times that reinforced that conflation. What I want to focus on is how um, the Roma as a group have been present in Europe for centuries, but are still not considered of Europe or addressed as Europeans today. And at the same time, uh, when there is a reckoning with either racism or enslavement in Europe or both, which happens um, seldom enough, but when it does happen, um, the Roma are not part of that reckoning either. Um, this is routinely restricted in terms of politics of memory in the, on the European continent, restricted temporally to the Holocaust, which is an understanding of conflating racism with anti-Semitism, um, or it is equating enslavement with the transatlantic trade, um, forgetting, conveniently forgetting, the fact that the Roma were enslaved for 500 years in the European East as well. So, what I mean by this is that Roma fall through these temporal and spatial cracks in Europe's current politics of memory. And I want to trace this structural forgetting, this structural oblivion, to an Occidentalist imaginary that equates, like I said, Europeanness with whiteness, and that has historically produced unequal Europe's in the south and east of the continent, 
to which those racialized as non-white and those um, other non-conforming either populations, histories, or events can routinely be relegated to this um, kind of forgetting. Drawing on um, Michel Rolf Trouillot's um, analysis of the Haitian Revolution as an unthinkable history uh, made by enslaved Black people, I argue that the European politics of memory will remain incomplete as long as the history and the present of anti-Roma racism, um, the legacies of Romani enslavement, and the implications of such histories for the possibility and impossibility of constructing an identity as Romani European are deemed unthinkable in an Occidentalist white Europe. And in order to um, start um, working through this argument, I need to start by um, talking a bit about the notion of whiteness. There's, of course, a huge literature that um, I won't have time to kind of give an overview of, but um, I think this is a forum in which people are familiar with the wider literature. What I'm interested in is, is focusing on how whiteness in the context of what I want to talk about is first and foremost, a relational category. Uh, in the context of Europe, the so-called West of Europe is white in inverted commas. The non-West of Europe is white, but not quite, which has even made it to the title of a book uh, recently published by Ivan Kalmar. Um, and the non-European world um, is non-white, again, in inverted commas, only in relation to each other, and only in a modern slash colonial world system premised on a constructed notion of whiteness as the norm. Um, and in this context, uh, whiteness is just as much a geopolitical category as it is a racial designation. The modern slash colonial world system piggybacked on previous forms, pre-modern forms of xenophobia and discrimination that um, were then incorporated as part of the logic of endless accumulation, just as other regimes of labor control um, that were not free labor, so slavery, serfdom, tenancy, uh, were incorporated into the logic of capitalist accumulation and reformulated, reconfigured, so that they would produce um, profit in a commodified um, capitalist world economy. For instance, of course, there were um, differences that uh, were kind of pinned on phenotype or, or on appearance, in ancient China, India, and Japan, fair skin implied wealth and mobility, while darker skin signaled work in, work in the field. But these were not racialized differences. They were more class differences, um, if we want to put it that way, um, that had no connection to um, ethnicity, more to religion, but had a connection to the class position in which one found itself. In Europe, uh, medieval Christendom offered an entire apparatus of otherness formed by unmarried and learned women that did not conform to um, the passive understanding of uh, women's place in uh, at the hearth. Heretics were non-conforming. Jews and Muslims were seen as the imperial um, other. That uh, all of these other figures or othered figures uh, prefigured colonial racism and sexism as um, Ella Shohat has brilliantly analyzed. It is through the incorporation of the Americas into the emerging world system that such imperial differences were transformed into colonial ones and how Europeanness, ethnicity and race were basically invented. And here uh, we get a differentiation between relational categories and the actual relation between them, namely what uh, both Stuart Hall, but also Maria Todorova have uh, discussed in terms of prevailing norms featuring as unmarked categories. Unmarked category as such is a concept by Maria Todorova, where um, she points out that um, the dominant norm, the one seen as the standard, never needs to be qualified or stressed. It is Europe or the West or heterosexuality as a norm or whiteness as the norm that does not need to be explicit, explicitated, does sometimes does not even need to be stated. If it's not stated, it is because it is the norm. It is then um, 
the normative character made visible through the simultaneous construction of difference of, for instance, the Orient as non-West, of Eastern Europe as lesser Europe, um, of homosexuality as non-heterosexuality, of non-binary uh, as um, the deviance from um, the binary norm, and not least blackness as non-whiteness, revealing the principle according to which it is non-normative categories that require naming. And so such categories become those that um, are interested in the sense of being marked categories that reveal the logic of construction of difference. So um, in the context of Europe, the label Europe, so the unmarked category that never needs to be stressed, includes both Western Europe and um, the population racialized as white, but Eastern Europe needs to be specifically mentioned in order to be included in the term. Um, until very recently, Black Europe was not a category that was speakable or analyzable, but ever since it did become at least a bit visible in a fragment of a literature, it needs to be argued and defended and explained how, how come we're speaking about a Black Europe, but what does that even mean? What is this history? Is it significant enough for us to even mention it? And in this context, the fact that the European East is often portrayed as semi-Oriental uh, then serves to sanction Western Europe's um, position as the norm, um, which is what brings me to the classification of unequal Europe's. What informed this mark, this unmarked um, category of Europe, so the reigning notion of Europe as Western, but one that doesn't need to be explicitated. What informed this reigning notion and its corresponding claims to civilization, to modernity, and to development was defined one-sidedly from positions of power, mainly associated with um, colonial and imperial rule around um, the 18th century with the rise to power of France and England and the competition and la um, later only with um, England's hegemony. So France and England as rising powers of the 18th century and as rising colonial powers at that, self-described as the producers of modernity's main revolutions, the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, and claimed the status in not so many words uh, of what I've termed heroic um, Europe that um, became the norm. Being European meant being centrally linked and having centrally authored uh, one of Europe's main revolutions, self-proclaimed main revolutions, um, where this self-serving narrative of proclaiming oneself the center and the triumphal, um, triumphalist kind of discourse surrounding it made, um, made it possible to relegate the previous, the early colonial powers Spain and Portugal to a lesser uh, decadent Europe um, that was seen as only participating in the history of this triumphant Western modernity and as being less um, of an author in that entire endeavor. At the same time, the relegation of the South of Europe, it was not just Spain and Portugal, but um, to a different and lesser extent, also Italy, meant that um, there's a, another Europe that not only relegates early colonial powers to those who are not heroic today, but also differentiates those that um, have been seen as perpetually catching up, the epigonal east of Europe that was reproducing the stages attained by heroic Europe in uh, transitioning to modernity, but had no um, say in it or had no, not an active participation in it. And this means that large parts of the European East that had lost out of colonial possessions overseas, so were not part of that competition, became the epigonal Europe from Greek epigon, the unworthy follower or the un unworthy um, heir that was perpetually trying to catch up. Even more important um, for today's definition of Europe is something that has been interesting me for a long time that I've been working on um, for 
few years now, the fact that colonial possessions, which were economically indispensable for the achievements claimed by heroic Europe for the industrial revolution, for development, for modernity, for civilization, and colonial possessions that were also administratively integral parts of Western European states played no part in the definition of Europe or its claims to modernity. Um, so there was no mention in the understanding that it is heroic Europe that produced an industrial revolution, that there would have been no industrial revolution without enslavement in the Caribbean and in South America and in North America. Um, the understanding was that um, the industrial revolution was self um, produced, that it was a, a self-enclosed achievement of an industrializing England. To these days, to these days, many of these areas, um, colonized areas, which today official language labels overseas countries and territories and outermost regions of Europe, are under the control of European states from the Dutch Caribbean and the French Antilles and the British Virgin Islands. They are what I've called forgotten Europe's that are co-produced by coloniality, but that have no claim to modernity. They are the geopolitically and discursively least visible group among the multiple and unequal Europe's that resulted from power shifts within and beyond the continent during the past five centuries. And I've called them forgotten Europe's not because um, for a long time, I was forgetting that we should include these territories in a definition of Europe because I was, but mostly because they are very much administratively, juridically part of Europe today, but are actively forgotten in the discourse of what it means to be European and in the definition of what it means to be European and white, because the conflation of European and white, the Europeanness and whiteness would not function, would actually implode if the understanding that Europe's colonial positions in the Caribbean today are European would be taken into account. It would need to take into account that integral parts of Europe today, and here's a map um, focused on Europe's um, colonial possessions, uh, primarily in the Caribbean, because that's the region that um, contains most of them to this day, uh, would show how a map of Europe would look like if we took into account the fact that the Western borders, not only of Europe as a historical region, but of the European Union as a political and economic project are in the Caribbean in and in South America today, South America with French Guyana being part of France. So this entire um, panorama of unequal Europe's and especially the focus on what I've called forgotten Europe's is meant to draw attention to how the structural forgetting, the structural oblivion, is a way of making historical and social um, and present reality a unthinkable reality today. So just as much as the parts of Europe situated in the Caribbean today, just as much as the Caribbean also contains uh, parts of the United States that are not seen as integral parts of the United States, such as Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands, is a way of making these territories unthinkable as part of the unmarked category, of the dominant category, of the norm. And so this brings me to the notion of unthinkable history put forth by Michel Rolf Trouillot in his book, um, Silencing the Past, um, about um, the Haitian Revolution, where uh, the revolution of the enslaved of Saint-Domingue um, against France and their proclamation of the world's first Black Republic in 1804 was relegated to either an event that would be minimalized, um, kind of bagatellized in the historiography um, emanating from um, Europe and the United States for a long time, or would not be mentioned at all. One of the things that uh, Trouillot makes clear in his um, analysis is how, for instance, Eric Hobsbawm, The Age of the Revolutions, did not even mention um, the Haitian Revolution at all. So Trouillot says the Haitian Revolution entered history with a peculiar characteristic of being unthinkable even as it happened. Um, 
This is, according to Toyo, uh, due to the fact that the contemporaries of the Haitian Revolution, including the most um, kind of highly regarded intellectuals, were reading through these events through ready-made categories, according to which enslaved people could not be political subjects, uh, according to which Black people could not um, make their own history. They were not seen as having agency, so that the solution of having this cognitive dissonance of the events happening under their eyes, but they are not having the theoretical categories to conceive of them as possible, led to a silencing, erasing, or trivializing um, the revolution as kind of the best um, possibility to deal with that um, cognitive dissonance. And that um, brings me then to how we have unthinkable Europeans today, not only through the point of um, the unthinkability or the forgetting of the, um, Europe's Caribbean populations, but also a larger and an older um, type of forgetting, that of um, unthinkable Europeans that are the Romani population. And this is, um, it may sound like a stretch, um, going from the Haitian Revolution to the enslavement of the Roma. I come to this stretch that I think is productive to think through uh, because of the fact that comparative studies of slavery um, have focused mostly on the Atlantic world and the global south, uh, which is why as unthinkable as the Haitian revolution is, and it was for a long time, it is still better known as the enslavement and emancipation of Romani uh, slaves in the Romanian principalities. At least among um, critical scholars, the Haitian revolution is known, there's much less um, on the enslavement of Romani people. Slavery scholarship has almost never included um, that um, phenomenon, the enslavement of Romani population in Eastern Europe uh, within its purview, and it's not seen as a part of comparative studies of enslavement. So we need a bit of background here. Slavery in um, Romanian is called Robia, was practiced on the territory of today's Romania in the European East for more than 500 years. Uh, so there's one huge parallel there with the European trade in enslaved people um, from Africa to the Americas. And as such, um, slavery in Romania was part of a labor regime with an elaborate infrastructure. Um, we can trace its beginnings um, to um, the period of the Mongol invasion of the region in the 13th century. But in structural terms, um, it began as a practice of enslaving prisoners of war throughout the European East and initially applied to Tatars, not to um, Roma people. After then, the settlement of large numbers of Roma people um, arrived from the Punjab region of India um, to um, the east of Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, um, mainly in the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia. I'm going to show a map here. That's a later map, but just so you get an idea of um, where we are situated. So Wallachia and Moldavia um, here um, in the south and the northeast of today's Romania were the parts um, in which enslavement as an institution existed for that long time. Um, you have um, here the, the Black Sea on um, the in the eastern part um, and then bordering Bessarabia, uh, Russia, and what was then Poland um, to the north. In um, these regions, enslavement, so in Wallachia and Moldavia, enslavement became a widespread phenomenon um, that sometimes crossed into Transylvania, that is the um, third um, so-called historical province of Romania there in the center. And as a distinct legal institution from serfdom, slavery developed alongside serfdom, and in some cases continued after serfdom ended. There were three kinds of enslaved people, those belonging to the, the prince or the state, those belonging to monasteries, and those belonging to nobles or boyars. The division into kinds then indicates how entrenched the institution of slavery was at multiple levels of society. 
But also, as in other cases, enslavement not only defines the relation between the enslaved and master, but more generally the relation between free and enslaved person. So the meaning of freedom was enmeshed with enslavement, which is why in the 17th century, which is when basically this uh, map starts uh, or starts representing that period, it was in the 17th century that uh, laws in Moldova and Wallachia began to be codified. Um, and the laws collected and recorded was what's called the old way or the old custom or the law of the land. This was um, very closely related to the claim of heroic Europe um, and the French Enlightenment of bringing civilization. So the idea was that uh, under the influence of French Enlightenment, but also as a function of reforms in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the project of collecting varieties of customary law was one of modernizing legislative initiatives in order to become more like the European West, in order to become emancipated, in order to be an enlightened um, kind of form of government. The idea also behind it, um, in terms of the typology of multiple and unequal Europe's that um, I've shown before, were part of an effort to leave behind an oriental past and position the principalities of Moldavia, Moldavia and Wallachia in the Western sphere, um, institutionally and economically. So the articles concerning um, the institution of slavery are uh, such nodes where the tension between customary law and modern law is most um, apparent. And at the same time, this um, is a situation that reflects similar contradictions in the writings of West European Enlightenment thinkers who uh, philosophically were condemning slavery. But when it came to the enslavement of Black Africans, they upheld um, slavery or uh, justified it on racial grounds, which is also an argument that Toyo has made, but also Susan Buck Morris has made. In another parallel, as in the Americas, the enslaved Roma people resisted the institution of slavery in a range of ways, pre predominantly by escaping. And there's um, a growing history of Romani resistance being written um, on archival documents also as we speak. The definition of enslavement had a clear economic framework. Um, it was seen as the enslaved owed themselves to their masters, owing themselves, meaning owing their labor. And there was an entire apparatus of both um, racialization and um, kind of um, commodification of the enslaved um, bodies in the um, understanding of the law in both principalities. For, so for instance, Lejuira Karaja, the Wallachian law included a chapter on sales, which divided things um, into moving and non-moving. Um, so as in the trade with enslaved Africans, who were listed as cargo on ships. One category of the Valachian law is formed by unmoving things and G word for Roma. So since the bodies of enslaved people move and they're valuable precisely because they move as they labor, uh, what does it mean to group them with unmoving things? This is the very process through which um, kind of an understanding of who is human and who belongs to the body politic is being formed as the uh, laws are being um, revised or as the laws are being codified. Um, the revision of the Moldovan law code, um, Regulamentor Organic, invokes the enslaved as family property and private property, historically covered by a legal principle of protitimis in an attempt to keep land in the property of a handful of families. This is um, a long history that I'm not going to be able to go through in, uh, in detail. Suffice it to say that the enslaved were emancipated in 1855, 1856. So um, 1859 is when the Romanian state um, is um, unified. So Moldova and, and Wallachia become one state. Transylvania is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. The emancipation of the enslaved Roma is a top-down process, also seen again with a nod to heroic Europe as a component of modernization in the Romanian principalities. Chronologically speaking, it was the first major social reform to take place there. Um, 
the abolition of serfdom, the other institution of um, unfree labor, and the transformation of the serfs into smallholders became law only in 1864. So, Later, almost a decade after the final emancipation laws. The opinion at the time was that the emancipation of the Roma could and should be carried out before the resolution of the more important and the more complicated problem of rural property, um, because certain radical voices viewed the emancipation of the Roma as the forerunner of the abolition of serfdom expressed in racial terms. The fall of black enslavement bodes announces the fall of white enslavement. So uh, the bigger problem and the one to be actually solved was the one of white serfdom, not that of uh, the enslavement of the racialized Roma. Um, again, in a parallel to the abolition of um, slavery in the Americas, a rhetoric of forgiveness was deployed throughout the emancipation period. So the enslaved were so-called forgiven what they owed. Um, and the two principalities, just as in the case of the Americas, offered compensation to owners for the economic loss, not however, to the enslaved. What um, is interesting is that the um, there are direct parallels and direct dialogues taking place at the time. Uh, for instance, the translation of Uncle Tom's Cabin into Romanian um, happened in 1853, but not from the English original, but from the French um, edition of that same year. And it was published um, not only as such, not only as a novel, but with a censored introduction by one of the leaders of the emancipation movement, Mihail Koganichanu, who used the opportunity to place the enslavement of the Roma in a world historical perspective and to, to argue for their emancipation. Um, the um, history kind of progresses from there, but interestingly, shortly after the publication of um, the translation of the uncle of Uncle Tom's Cabin, another modernizing initiative, which was the one of writing Romanian literature in Romanian, which was um, rather new um, at the time, was um, the publication then of uh, several installments of the uh, novel by Vasile Urechia, Little Mary's Cabin, Mariuka's um, um, Cabina Mariuca, um, as a parallel, as a kind of um, simile to um, Uncle Tom's Cabin in a Romanian context in which Little Mary, Mariuka, was an enslaved Roma woman. So the idea of translation was one of translating both the historical and the social context, and in a way, um, kind of adding a gender component to it, it was an enslaved woman that was being portrayed there, uh, not an enslaved man. What is um, interesting um, in the context of how many um, un worked through documents, archival documents there are. Um, today, there's um, plenty that are being worked on right now by um, several of our, our Roma colleagues um, in, in, in Romania, but um, some of the articles and the documents that attest to the resistance of enslavement are still to be not unearthed, but actually um, they're uh, they are unearthed, but they need to be funded um, for somebody to do the actual research um, on it. The interesting um, work being done by um, my colleague um, Adrian Nicolae Fortuna, together with uh, Victor Claudio Turcitu, is kind of offering, and this is an open access publication that um, came out in 2021, an album of social history documenting Roma slavery and um, the places of memory is that um, actually the data is out there. The, the research can be done. The history is known, is not only known um, to those who have lived it, but is more and more known to those who have um, been exposed to its implications and also who have tried to work through the way um, stereotypes, racialization of the Roma in Europe today is ongoing despite um, this long history and despite there having been no um, structural initiatives of 
social justice, of reparations, of, or of other um, negotiations. But um, work is ongoing and is being done not only in Romania, so not only on the ground, but also uh, with different um, artistic um, initiatives, such as um, the one presented in 2019 uh, called Roma Women Weaving Europe that um, very much emphasized the role played by um, projects that highlight the experiences, both historical and present, of Roma women um, in Europe. And I'm reading from the uh, description of the project that says, gender inequality has become a major focus of contemporary debates in recent years throughout the world. The approximately um, 6 million Roma women in Europe know all too well about the impact of gender inequality because they face multiple and intersectional discriminations. As women, members of a stigmatized ethnic minority being at higher risk of social exclusion and poverty, which has pushed them to creatively challenge patriarchal and racialized oppression. The everyday struggle of Roma women has become a focal foundation for the gradual emergence of Roma feminism as a movement against injustice. Um, and so there are multiple, not only multiple initiatives, but also um, multiple ways of addressing what is still a structural problem that had, had initiated and was uh, cemented through the institution of enslavement in Romania, but is a European problem um, today that uh, regards not seeing through this history as European history, but constantly or sometimes still kind of considering the Roma as migrants, although um, we they have migrated 1000 years ago to Europe. So um, one at some point um, has to be seen as um, having arrived, which is still not the case um, for uh, Romani, the, the Romani population and the category of Romani Europeans, therefore is still unthinkable in a European context. On a more hopeful uh, note, the idea that um, the Roma and African-Americans share a common struggle has been relatively recently highlighted in a joint article published in The Guardian, um, co-authored by um, Margarita Matake and Cornel West, uh, pointing to how these parallels are not only something that concern Europe, not only something that concern the stigmatized and racialized group of Romani Europeans themselves, but they are, um, a joint endeavor that concerns everyone who is working towards a more just um, system in which the parallels that have been bequeathed to us um, between stigmatized and racialized populations are something to be worked through together rather than as separate projects. And I think I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much. Um, Professor McConey, the floor is yours. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Manuel. I want to start off with a contemporary event and then move backwards. Uh, if the idea of uh, Black Europe is unthinkable, how do they then account for the racial composition of the French football World Cup team? Those that would argue the idea of a Black Europe is unthinkable. How do you reconcile that with the lineup of the Black team, of the, of the Black members of the French team, of the French football World Cup team? Right. Oh. Uh, should I answer immediately? Oh, yeah, yes, just a conversation. Then I'll okay. move on to another series of questions. This is um, actually something that, that comes up periodically. Uh, it was not just this year's World Cup, but it's kind of it becomes yeah. visible as it is mediatized and it, it's mm -hmm. visible in the media. But it's um, very um, quickly being relegated to, you know, it's, this is a, a media event. This is like a one-time moment. It doesn't uh -huh. lead to thinking through the dem demography of France uh, mm -hmm. 
consistently. It's something that is being addressed where um, kind of the visible and especially the um, successful players mm -hmm. are then kind of perceived as honorary French, but uh, not because um, they belong, but because their success makes them more French than they used to be before they were successful and before they became visible. And this is, we've seen this dynamic in different um, other examples where even um, the sans papier, the, those who are undocumented um, in France, um, kind of committing some um, kind of honorable um, deeds. There was the story about um, in, an undocumented migrant saving a child that had almost <laughs> fallen from a balcony, and then all of a sudden they be became documented because Macron um, gave them papers as in recognition of the heroic act. Well, do you need to save a life to get papers and to be recognized as a human being? And what does that say? What does that very exceptional uh, treatment of one person say about how the structural um, inequality operates otherwise, because not everyone gets a chance to um, kind of be on TV for having done something heroic uh, and then get papers. Okay, then the other, thanks a lot for this. Um, when you're talking about describing your different categories, let's say like heroic Europe, you have France, England, what do, um, where does Scotland and Ireland fit in there? I could see, for example, heroic uh, France and England, decadent Spain and Portugal. So as you were talking, I was wondering, what about um, Scotland? What about Ireland? Where do they fit in in these categories? Or is there a category called heroic decadent, which, co which combines both the heroic and the decadent parts of uh, Spain and Portugal? Mm -hmm. Right, thank you so much. That gives me a chance to uh, clarify that the, the country names in mm -hmm. the one category were just the prototypes, right? The, okay. The, so the ones that fit best, um, the okay. discourse of being either heroic, being either decadent or being epigonal. So everything else, basically most of Europe is in between uh, one of these categories. Okay. Okay. You have heroic Germany, for instance, that is um, also heroic at some point, but first it's a late industrializer, so it's not heroic. It becomes mm -hmm. that uh, later. You have Greece and Italy that belong to the decadent, but not directly because they weren't the colonial powers that had lost out. They were just um, kind of losing out of the economic rise to which France and England um, participated or mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, uh, profited. And then uh, Scotland and Ireland are um, part of the um, the territory and the population that England needs to uh, discriminate against, to enslave and to uh, either drive away or kind of uh, delimit itself from in order to even voice a discourse of heroic industrial revolution that has been achieved against the agricultural, the backward, the primitive, the, uh, the rural, right? Um, that's how I, I would put it. Oh, okay. Then let me intellectually get you back to something that you talked about, but I, I think I, I missed it a bit. Uh, conceptually in this uh, map that you are painting for us, you talked a bit about the Haitian revolution. Can you just sort of re-articulate where exactly is, where does the Haitian revolution fit into this uh, discussion? Or what is the impact of the Haitian revolution on the analytical categories that you are using and the story that you are telling. Right, so my point was that um, the discourse on how um, Europe and the West became modern, civilized yes. and um, kind of progressive structurally leads, leaves out these histories, the history yeah. of enslavement, the history of the Haitian revolution as a revolution, the agency um, of um, enslaved people, the resistance, and the need for reparations. And this happens in parallel um, with Romani history in a 
similar but also different way because that is even less well known uh, although there was it wasn't a revolution in the same way but it was enslavement in the same way so we have several of these histories we have piles of these histories that mm-hmm. need to be recuperated in order for us to have a um, a coherent and a complete history of europe what we have so far is a very western centric one a very occidentalist mm-hmm. one that only remembers um, the positive sides and the positive sides from a western european perspective Oh, I see what you mean, I see what you mean. Okay, then as I continue with that, you talked about Romani feminism. What is that all about? And how does it differ from uh, what I would regard as my prototypical understanding of white feminism or African feminism? Right. What, 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 what is it seeking to accomplish, to be more specific? And what does it understand to be the nature of the relationship between patriarchy and matriarchy in Romani feminism? Mm. That's a very complex um, question, but also mm. a, a complex answer to give because Romani feminism is, as as you pointed out, working through actually um, the differences between white feminism, black mm. feminism, and mm. other feminisms out mm. there. Uh, mm-hmm. and at the same time working through patriarchal structure in Romani communities themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it has a lot to do with the image of um, the the Romani woman um, in mm-hmm. a very stereotypical way, kind of brought in in um, connection to magic, um, mm-hmm. in connection to irrationality, uh, and in connection with a, a visual appearance that Mm -hmm. is the opposite of the modern, of the elegant, of the urban, of the civilized, Mm -hmm. um, that is associated with uh, thievery, but that uh, links into the understanding of uh, the Roma as a group themselves, always seen as the um, the criminal um, part of society. That is exacerbated or or compounded for um, Roma women. even more. So working through that is working through a a racial um, structure that is at the same time gendered uh, through an imaginary of Roma women um, being very, um, having many children that they do not uh, take um, good care of, that they do not uh, send to school, but also being um, the ones that are dressed uh, inappropriately and very visible for their very floral pattern, colorful dresses, um, something that speaks um, for both the, the visual appearance as such, but also of an understanding of what it means to be properly attired and what it means mm-hmm. to be to belong to, to dress for an urban setting and, you know, sure, mm-hmm. sending children to school um, would is seen as the opposite of that, just based on the appearance. Um, I'm not giving a good um, Mm -hmm. overview of Romani feminism because uh, there's (laughs) there's a lot to be said that has to do with precisely that working through. So I did mention the visual appearance because um, this is a huge issue for Mm -hmm. uh, Romani feminists, um, kind of pinpointing how important the dress is for their self-understanding and self-identification. At the same time, this is a um, visual imagery that has been completely stigmatized as associated with poverty, lack of education, and um, criminal behavior. So salvaging that aesthetic Mm -hmm. from stigma is a huge part of the endeavor of feminism that is at the same time linked to um, understanding that this is this is beautiful, but this is beautiful f- from a specific understanding of gender that is not part mm-hmm. of how we understand gender. So we need to work through both in order to see how that aesthetic has its own kind of um, role, its own configuration and its own right, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I think that's convoluted. No, no, that makes sense. Now, my question is, um, can you give me the names of any of these uh, scholars who work in Romani feminism? Who who are they? Are there any any feminists who are Romani ethnically or racially who are working in this area themselves? Mm. 
yes so um those people from um from the the project that i i just um shown or mm -hmm. um i can um show you the um the project again but also okay. whom i've named is yes. one of the prominent um scholars um also christiana grigore who works at the um columbia um columbia project on mm -hmm. i'll have to look it up um that with with a focus on um, Romani people, um, these are people who work uh, Romani uh, feminists working in the U.S. Uh, oh, a whole, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank, thanks a lot. I will um, I will send you an email. Then you can uh, give yeah. me the names again. Yes. Then my last question, and then um, I'll hand over to Byron. Um, the, this article that you cited, which was written by Cornell West. And um, is it Margaret? I can't. I didn't. I can't. Yes, yes. 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 What was the core of the argument the two of them were making? The idea is that um, the um, enslavement of African Americans is well known, but the mm -hmm. struggle is still ongoing. While the Roma enslavement is less known, um, and absolutely the struggle is maybe in more in the beginning of getting uh, world attention the struggle has yes. been there the entire time but that uh, it is a stronger struggle if the parallels are acknowledged and the fact that it's it's a common struggle and not something that should be broken down into well the african americans have their own battle to fight and the roma have their own battle to fight and one is in the us and the other is in europe and what does that the one have to do with each other they're both both forms of enslavement that had to do with a commodification of human life and of labor that would not have happened either of them would not have happened um unless the logic of capital accumulation had um, made it possible to conceive of labor as not human and just restricted to labor. And that's how both were conceived. So working through this um, is actually adding um, resources through the struggle because there are more historical instances of understanding what was going on if you have more patterns in which this was um, used or in this employed. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me stop here so that I can allow my colleagues, some of whom have got questions in the chat, to, to jump in. Byron, thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, Arthur Spears has his hand up. Arthur, and you can take over. You are muted, Arthur. <laughs> Arthur, you're muted. I'm muted. Your microphone. It's hmm. your microphone is muted. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear. Ah. Oh, okay. no. Yes. Again. Click again. Click again. Oh. Yes. Don't touch. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I muted it, and then it muted again. Okay. I'm trying to clarify some things in my own mind. Mm -hmm. Mine with questions that I have had, but haven't been able to do anything with in the last few decades. One has to do with comparing Roma slavery and uh enslavement in the u.s among african americans uh there was lots of internal differentiation during slavery in the u.s that is sort of a silent history not as much as the haitian revolution but my question is what were the differences within roman uh, Roma enslavement in Romania. For example, among the Black population in the U.S., there was internal differentiation, sometimes officialized, along skin color lines. So there were degrees, in other words, of Blackness or non-whiteness. 
The other thing is that while enslavement existed in the U.S., um, there were both free and enslaved yeah. black people. And I'm wondering if there's a parallel parallel in Roma slavery. The third thing is there was a difference. There was an intellectual class basically throughout enslavement, but much better known from the 18th century, uh, from the uh, 19th century on. Did you have some, uh, so one of the questions is if you had something parallel among uh, uh, the Roma. The mm. second question, and I want to get this in all now because I may not <laughs> get answer later. Um, degrees of whiteness or unwhiteness in Europe. Here, my questions revolve around several considerations. Uh, one, for example, when I first went to France in 1962, I heard several times that Africa begins south of the Pyrenees. So that said to me, and you can tell me if I was correct or not, that there was some notion of non-whiteness within Europe, and there probably has been continuously. And that's one of the uh, things that I'd like for you to respond to. Uh, some other uh, the other issue, and I'll just use one of these concerns, the Irish. Um, there are, for example, texts that indicate that the Irish were construed as infrahuman, going back as far as the 12th century. Okay, there's quite a bit of literature now on the racialization of the Irish, but I'm not sure whether that racialization in later centuries, after the 12th century, involved their being non-white or not. So I'm trying to fit them within this broader question concerning the question of whether there was a non-whiteness conceptualization in Europe over the past, what, uh, millennium? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. All right, uh, I have another forty-five minutes. <laughs> oh, oh no! Just jump in, jump in. This is a conversation now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whatever yeah. insights you have. Whatever yeah. insights you have. Yes. <laughs> no, okay. these are these are amazing questions, and um, it, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for um, the opportunity to to engage with some of them. Um, the parallel here are, I think. Um, stronger than one might think, the parallels between um, enslavement of the Roma and, and African Americans um, in terms of the status. There, there were differentiations depending on whether the enslaved belonged to the church, to the nobles, or to the state. Um, and that meant um, a lot um, in terms of how well you fared and how hard uh, you had to work and, and what exactly you had to work. Um, but there was no um, parallel, at least that we know of, or at least the documents that have been worked through so far, that would warrant speaking about an intellectual class. There were individual figures there that can always be kind of singled out, but speaking of an intellectual class is uh, not possible for the very reason that there were very, very few uh, free um, Roma people. The possibility of gaining um, freedom was buying yourself out uh, at a certain point from a certain um, type of engagement, not from uh, the monastery in the same way as from the state, not from the boyar in the same way as um, from the, the other two. And what is being worked through right now, and this was um, in the album of social history that I, that I showed, um, are documents um, looking at how the buying of freedom was made in the name of the offspring, not in one's own name. So often services were, um, so kind of selling labor was seen as selling labor as a way of paying off debt so that the offspring would be free. Um, and whether or not that 
actually happened, we don't know. We have kind of court cases that uh, try the claim of an enslaved Roma woman to free her child, provided that um, she works um, until she dies for that particular noble. So see, it's a, it's a more intricate, um, or it's, it's more difficult to even say um, there, there was a structural possibility to achieve um, freedom. And of course you could be freed, and, but that is also again, a parallel. Um, the um, differentiation um, alongside skin color is less um, pronounced in the in the Romanian case because there's um, phenotypically alone the Roma were not the only dark skinned pe people in Romania, so it was very hard to even pinpoint who is and who isn't um, Romani. It was actually the, the kind of um, labor status and um, the history of your family being having been disenfranchised for a long time that would make sure that you were um, seen as, as Roma or not. And, and to this day, it's not, um, I mean, it's all a construction as we know, but um, within Europe as a whole, it's much, um, more difficult to speak of degrees um, of um, whiteness um, because whiteness is a lot politicized in terms of the um, the documents with which you circulate, for instance. Um, it's your passport that's being racialized. It's your status that's being racialized. Um, making sure that it's your skin color that betrays you, uh, less so. Um, so that's a a convoluted answer. Um, what I'm, I'm trying to get to is that this translation of status into race not only had a long history, but was a protracted transformation from the racialization of religion, which was how it all started, uh, both with the Jews and Muslims, but also with the Irish. So there's this book by Michael Ignatieff, How the Irish Became White, um, that discusses how Catholics in the US um, were seen as non-white on account of being Catholics uh, because of the uh, Protestant um, prominence of what it meant to be um, a US American. That is part of an understanding of how religion functions in many ways in Europe, as a proxy for race. So it's not so much skin color, it's degrees of being um, associated more with what is being defined out of Europe. It's not Christianity, it's uh, not whiteness, then you're probably not European, then you're probably not white, then you're probably something that is um, a racialized category, uh, but what exactly that is would depend on the context. And it could be that you're a Muslim, it could mean that you're Roma, and sometimes you could be both, um, and, and so on. I hope that answers a few things. Yeah, that gets me a lot further along oh, oh, in uh, my thinking. But it, and, and Africa beginning at the Pyrenees, sorry, um, th this was crucial actually, um, because this is the very moment that um, defines the relegation of um, Spain and Portugal to a decadent Europe, decadent in the sense of declining from power. Um, and the, the allegation is um, the fact that um, there is such a strong um, African presence in the Iberian Peninsula and Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula means that Spain and Portugal will never be modern enough, that they're both too feudal and too non-white to be European. And this is how the, the whole argument of heroic Europe being the um, kind of white, modern, civilized, progressive industrial power is being constructed and saying, well, um, Africa, uh, sorry, um, Spain and Portugal are too close to Africa to be truly European, just as the east of Europe is too close to the Ottoman Empire and too close to Asia to be truly European. So there's not much left <laughs> for mm -hmm. Europe to be Europe. You have to be some part of the Northwest somehow. Uh -huh. Just one quick question. Uh, the first time I went to Romania, um, I mixed a lot with university students. And uh, one I became particularly uh, friendly with eventually invited me home to dinner. I went to dinner in a building where construction had started, but it had been abandoned. 
The family lived on the first floor of what was to be a multi-story building with a dirt floor, no separate rooms, just the space, with the kitchen being a fire and a very large pot in the center. And so essentially they were cooking and eating a perpetual stew sort of like in other places of the world where there's always a pot going and whatnot. Now, what my question was for them, they were very light skin and very white in quotation marks. The son was going to the university. Uh, I don't know where the rest of the family was. So I did not want to ask and I could not figure out whether they were Roma or not. Were Roma going to university in the 60s and 70s? And the second part concerning skin color, you've already answered. But uh, in retrospect, I'm just wondering if that would have fit a profile of Roma who were ascending in terms of education and social status and so forth? Mm -hmm. It's hard to speculate for that particular case, but um, yes, um, Romania had um, univers universal healthcare, universal education and free university education um, back then. So in principle, it would have been very possible for um, them to attend college and um, like go through entire school system. Now, what did happen on the ground and the reason why the stereotype of um, Romani um, people not sending their children to school or not regularly enough is that um, children were very much discriminated against. And if you didn't have the chance, so in school um, and, if you didn't have the chance to pass for white um, or kind of hide your Romani background, um, there was a big chance that you would be a target of such discrimination. If then you were resilient enough and pull through, um, then you could make it to college, which uh, many did. But the official position was, of course, everyone can go to college and everyone is encouraged to do so. But um, on the ground, there were very many hindrances and um, that is like, including the fact that um, it wasn't that um, long ago um, in the, so when state socialism came about after two world wars, that um, people who had been emancipated at, um, in the 19th century could have accumulated any uh, serious resources to speak of of which they could live. And state socialism certainly did not provide those, provided universal healthcare, provided you know, basic education and so on. But if you did not, and as you described this um, very well, if you lived in very dire conditions, this is the very basis for discrimination. We have lots of stories today that recount how, how um, people say, well, I was constantly told I'm, I'm dirty and I'm, I smell and uh, I, I was afraid to go back and I didn't want to, but I was really good at math, but I didn't go back. So um, there's not one cause that plays a, a role there, but there's many factors leading up to very different individual outcomes, despite the structural possibility of this being a success story. Thank you. Thank I you, have Dr. Thousand questions, but I won't ask any more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a couple of comments in the chat, and then we can go to Dr. Burnett and Dr. Pussy McConey's question. So, um, Dr. Motaboli said, "Thank you, Prof. Manuela, for exposing the dishonesty of European academia and academics for selectively recording histories of Africans and Roma for purpose of explaining them out of history and their achievements." What can we do presently to prevent similar dishonesty happening with presentation of modernism as European and ruling out other groups such as Africa, Roma, and Asia? <laughs> um, I'm, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, I think the, the answer is quite predictable in that we are in a context in which 
we have the privilege of imparting education and of spreading that kind of um, information as education. And I think this is crucial in understanding um, all of the links between different forms of discrimination and making sure that they are not individual anecdotes um, that we mention once and never come back to, but that we constantly relate the way I um, spoke about um, whiteness as a relational category, um, the ways in which different processes of racialization that are structurally similar are applied mostly conveniently to different groups. And the fact that um, the racial stereotypes behind them tend to sound familiar, um, makes them ring true, but they're not true. They're just familiar because they've had, they've been repeated several times. It's only through being exposed to an educational process in which this is linked together and is repeated um, in a way that links it to uh, links the history to the present that we can um, kind of make sure that more and more people are aware of this. Now, awareness is not solving the problem yet, but I think it is a, a crucial condition for uh, changes in both uh, media discourse, which plays a big part, and political discourse, which plays a big part, and individual behavior, which is um, something uh, related, but also each one's responsibility. I hope that uh, is not too general an answer. Uh, it's not a specific kind of um, indication of how to go about it yourself, but I, I do believe strongly in the power of um, education. Thank you. And Vishnu Milojic has a short comment about um, this is very interesting to me. I have a close friend in Serbia who teaches grade school Romani students. And yes, in Serbia, there is definitely a prevalent view that education is not prioritized among the Romanis. And yes, um, Dr. Burnett. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Walker, for um, your presentation. It's really, really fascinating. Um, I, I wondered um, with the, the, the definitions of, of whiteness that we're working with um, to, to sort of maybe pin down a little bit. I've, I find uh, Cheryl Harris's whiteness as property very, very useful to think with um, where kind of the property of being white uh, firstly, gives you sort of ownership of your own body, so control over, you know, that you can't be owned as a slave. Um, also, it gives you the right to own property, so that, you know, unlike um, Indigenous populations who don't really own property, you can actually own it, you can actually have the legal right to, to, to land, etc. And then thirdly, um, it gives you the right to kind of reparations if someone says, does something bad to you, you know, then you can inherit a right, which you can't if you're not white. Um, it's that kind of gets cancelled intergenerationally. Um, uh, so, and of course, she's working in, in the American context um, and, you know, talking about um, uh, transatlantic slavery and the dispossession of Native Americans, etc. So I wondered if some of that kind of quite specific legal analysis of the, of the Roma case might be generative in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, many of these aspects are um, greatly relatable also in, in the Roma case, especially um, kind of the owning and not, not owning of property was is a red thread through the entire history of uh, enslavement, because when you are property, you cannot own property. That was um, a part of how um, the laws were codified. And also owing labor meant that um, once emancipation happened, um, the rhetoric of forgiveness could be applied about having, um, you were forgiven your debt. So your debt was your labor. So, you know, that, that's, um, it's, a, it's a very perverse, but very um, convincing rhetorical figure, right? As to how this is, um, this is what em emancipation is, is like. Um, I would add that um, whiteness, should be linked both to property and citizenship. And I, I'm not sure whether this is a chronological or a logical connection or both, um, because there are analyses that um, I've used um, from legal scholars. One of them is Ayla Chahar, who talk about citizenship as property. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the bundle of rights that is connected to um, 
the citizenship rights of a certain country is historically um, a, a, the historical accumulation of, well, sometimes the dispossession of others and the exclusion of others, and um, is a possibility to bequeath the same bundle of rights to the next generation. So in very many ways, not just metaphorically, but legally, as, as Shahar points out, citizenship is property. Now, the citizenship rights, as we know, have been, um, allotted very differently, but some citizenships um, are racialized very differently than others. And having a certain citizenship gives you different rights to property. And also um, different citizenships entitle you to different things. If you have a citizenship of a poor state, that would mean that your access to healthcare is poor healthcare, that your access to, I don't know, starting with clean water is, um, more or less uh, guaranteed to an education and so on and so forth. So this is where um, in a modern colonial world system in which accumulation was the guiding principle, property was central uh, and it was pinned to uh, different forms of um, unequal allotment. Um, whiteness was one of the most pervasive ones. Citizenship is a much later invention, very much having to do with the French and the Haitian revolutions. But there are many others in between in which property is actually the central principle. And what is being pinned to um, then is only one of, a, of the many mechanisms to um, allot or to distribute unequally. I think that's how I put it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to Dr. Pussy McConey. Uh, thanks uh, for such an informative talk. I'm sorry, I'm not going to turn on the uh, video because I don't think you all want to see me in my PJs. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> honestly, I enjoyed your talk uh, greatly. While I understand that whiteness is differently articulated throughout the world system, I am trying to clarify some things in my own mind. Is it possible that all the different ideas of whiteness coalesce around privilege? In other words, is whiteness ever not privilege? Hmm. Um, that's a very interesting question, um, especially the way you worded it. Because you know, privilege um, comes from private law. Um, so that that's the etymological source of it, right? So whiteness, but all other privileges have to do with how they are codified in a system that recognizes them as superior to the residual category or the marked category. So with, if whiteness is the unmarked category, then the privilege consists not in whiteness, but in uh, the principle that put whiteness on the top uh, or made it the norm and defined everything else in relation to it and in actually um, distinction to it and inferior distinction to it. So I wouldn't, uh, we cannot understand whiteness as a privilege or not as a privilege outside of a historical context in which that happened, in which um, there was a, a gradual association of humanity with white Europeanness that was not there from the beginning. European colonizers came from all uh, different um, social classes. Um, it was white Europeans who were enslaved in the beginning um, as well as indigenous populations, but it was only gradually in the 17th, 18th century that we get this association of enslavement with blackness, which means whiteness uh, is Europeanness is free labor. But that was not always the case. So we there's a long history of this um, privilege of whiteness becoming um, a privilege. Um, before that, the Privilege consisted in military power, in the economic power, in brutal force, um, but not necessarily in whiteness. So, 
here I would just be for historicizing, and I'm, I'm sure I'm talking to historians who all think that this sociological explanation was very historically undifferentiated, but I tried my best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Oyewumi. Hello, Ronke. Great. Hey, Manuela. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my talk. Well, that's oh, my. Oh, my. I, I had I was dreaming of it. I had to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I really so, appreciate I'm it. I'm so sorry. Like, Bussy, I don't want you to see my, my very sexy pajamas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, Manuela, this is wonderful. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. I have many questions. Okay. Well, before before I, I, I pose my questions and comments, I want the audience to know that Manuela speaks at least six or seven languages. <laughs> <laughs> we have to invite her back to do something. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, she, yeah, she and, can and, come with, she can come I'm as many you, as you And want. I'm reminded of that. When she was answering Boosie's question, when she said privilege, it comes from this root and that. And I'm saying, wow, <laughs> she's poaching her different languages and she speaks at least five European languages. OK, so she has many resources to draw upon. I always find her fascinating. Let me get to let me get to to my questions. But even before I go to my question. The question that Busi asked so, so eloquently and the way you answered reminded me of the Afrikaners in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think it was before apartheid when they were very poor and destitute. And I'm remembering the work of Tiffany Herard that the Carnegie Foundation said that they were a disgrace to, to whiteness. And so, Gave, gave money so that they can be elevated mm -hmm. in South Africa <laughs> in order to shore up that category called white. So as you said, these things are constructed. Uh, it didn't come from heaven, <laughs> this inherentness of whiteness, okay? Then my question, one of my questions is this and has to do with the construction of whiteness, given the very, very large footprint of the USA and the Americas in the construction of whiteness, I wondered what impact the construction of whiteness in North America, most especially, what impact it had on the European categories mm. over time. And I'm also thinking, of this whole idea that when Europeans of one sort or the other come to the US, they are automatically white. And as James Baldwin put it, they want to use the N word against black people. So I wondered whether, whether you were Roma or other European in, the, in, in, in Europe, but as soon as you crossed into the US, there's a certain privilege associated with where you are coming from. And it's always against black people in America. So I wonder what sort of impact that has on our categorization at the intellectual level and even on the ground for people coming into the country. That's one question. Mm -hmm. And then I really like your drawing our attention to unequal Europe and, and all that. And I, I started to wonder, and this is just wondering about what are the implications of unequal Europe to our understanding of colonization in Africa? When we're mm -hmm. thinking of French colonization, Portuguese colonization, I wondered whether if we're really conscious of this unequal Europe, that mm. it enable us to do better work or not. And I hope that some of my colleagues can also speak to that. And then a question I've been wanting to ask you, and I'm sure if I, I read more of you, I probably would know the answer. What is your response and how do you place this work you've done in relation to 
Anibakiano's coloniality of power and the origins of race. I'd like to know what you think about the origins of race as you look at the Roma. And uh, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Another 45 minutes here. Um, <laughs> But I, I would, if possible, um, like to start with the last question, because um, also that's the uh, easiest one. Um, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Quijano's work and my understanding of coloniality and of the modern colonial world system has a lot to do with the literature on coloniality that would not have been possible without Quijano's work. Um, it's a uh, different focus regionally and historically than Quijano and the uh, decoloniality um, group have um, that I engage in because I think um, basically what I presented here makes the same argument. You know, there's a lot of um, engagement with Atlantic history, with the transatlantic trade, with that history of enslavement and what that did to capitalism. Um, I think it is important to complement that with a focus on um, what that meant in the European context, both in terms of forgetting the history of enslavement of the Roma, but also um, imperial differences that are not um, resolved by just speaking of coloniality as encompassing the entire world, but we would need to work through the differences that European empires were still producing and were still um, dominating well into the 20th century. So long after coloniality had started, we had something like, as Laura Doyle calls it, inter-imperiality, very much still shaping both Europe and Asia. And that is something that the decoloniality literature does not um, really grasp, uh, with the exception of people like Marina Tostanova and uh, Reddy Kobach um, and others who are working on um, the, in, the imperial difference and um, Central Asia and the Eastern Europe. Um, all right. Also, to the, um, the example of Afrikaners in, in South Africa and the constructedness um, of that, um, specific type of whiteness, I was reminded of another example of how the Japanese were considered honorary whites um, after World War II uh, as a political um, form of acknowledgement of alliance and of uh, kind of being on, a, on the same on, or on eye level um, with um, the US. So here, the idea of um, transforming what used to be a racialized category of different parts of Asia, but also Jap Japan in, in particular, became a honorary um, kind of awarding of whiteness on the part of um, Europeans, but also the US. Now, the large question of the US's um, impact on European categories, um, I was thinking when you um, were speaking of the history of how um, US categories traveled to Europe, specifically to Germany. Um, Otto Lord uh, spent some years in Berlin um, and had seminars with um, European uh, and, and Black Germans um, who were um, kind of interested in um, working through um, racial struggles and racial discrimination. And it was through Otto Lord's um, suggestion that Afro-Germans would refer to themselves as Afro-Germans, that the term entered both the discourse, but also the German language. So Afro-Deutsch did not used to exist before Oderlord um, introduced it. The thing is, the evolution of the terms did not take the same trajectory as in the US, um, because as we know, African-American comes at the end as, as a term comes at the at the end of a long evolution from the, the n word to uh, uh, kind of it's nuancing to black to uh, afro-american to african-american african-american never arrived in germany uh, or as far as i know in french so it's the afro plus um 
kind of the na national designation is where it stopped at in Europe. But that in itself is a huge um, impact because that makes it possible. And I think that relates to a question that maybe I didn't answer um, enough, where, where, the, where Black Europe becomes thinkable, right? It's possible to have a Black Europe if you have the Afro-French and the Afro-Germans and the Afro-Swedes and the Afro-Belgians. And, and that did not used to be speakable. So um, the speakable and the thinkable are ways in which um, an impact that for me is, is um, essential of giving a vocabulary um, for a racial struggle that is different, that we have to work through, that we have to uh, analyze differently, but it, there's still enough of structural similarities for us to engage with it as a racial struggle, has a possibility to even um, take off. We have um, an analysis once we have a possible vocabulary for it. Now then comes the um, problem, the critique that has always been made that Europe is importing a US racial category or racial uh, system um, of terminology in order to apply it to Europe and it doesn't translate easily. The same has uh, been discussed with respect to Brazil, right? It's not the same racial um, um, terminology and the same system in Brazil as it is in the US. So just importing the US's um, categorizations does not work. That has to be worked through. But I think having a vocabulary is the main contribution that I would at least um, be interested in. Um, yeah, and the last one, the unequal Europe's um, impact on Africa. I'm very happy you asked that question. Um, on the one hand, you know, the fact that um, the east of Europe did not have any colonies was not for lack of trying. So the mm -hmm. fact that um, the epigonal Europe is only that, that it's only epigonal, uh, means that there was, they lost out in a, in a colonial competition. But there were many other ways in which um, the east of Europe, uh, and so the epigonal Europe as such, or the decadent Europe, the early colonizers profited from um, the ongoing colonial endeavor and profited then also um, from the partition of Africa. Even during state socialism, and there is very interesting work being done um, on that, uh, especially by, um, or one that I know very well, let's say, is um, the work of my colleague Lukas, uh, Lukas Stanek, who has worked on architects from the um, East European state socialist countries um, going to Africa to consult on architectural projects in the um, kind of in, in projects that had a social architecture as an ideal mm -hmm. and how whiteness very much functioned as, as a privilege there. There was an international solidarity going on. That's why the Eastern European architects were there in the first place. The idea that oh, socialist architecture was the um, final goal, uh, and that's why a joint project was desirable, was very much there. But in the end, when decisions had to be made or when conflict ar arose, it was the white European, and in that case, an Eastern European who might not have been quite white within Europe, but was definitely white in Africa, who had the last word. And so, Absolutely, uh, whiteness functions as a privilege there, but I do think that we need unequal um, Europe's as um, a category or, or a, a classification with several categories to understand uh, the, the nuances there and the differences. I'll leave Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question before the after party. And Dr. McCune, um, after your questions, we can hand over to Dr. McCune for the closing statement. Okay, uh, for whatever it is worth, I'd like to make up a couple of comments. Uh, this this uh, lecture has been very enlightening. Um, I grew up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And when I grew up, we, the locals, were just people. We didn't identify ourselves as Blacks or whatever. And whites were the other kind of people and we didn't identify them by race, we identified them as Mundele. Mundele, that's translated as European, but in our indigenous languages, originally it meant people from the cemetery. 
uh, because we thought of them, we thought of them as similar to ghosts, and we were afraid of ghosts, and we as, uh, ascribed to them the power of the ghosts, which had facilitated the colonization of Africa, I think. Um, and so um, privilege becomes an epiphenomenon in this kind of history, uh, coming with the power that they accumulated uh, during colonization. But then in reading the uh, history of the United States, what I learned is that there were different kinds of whites, Nordic whites as opposed to Mediterranean whites. And Mediterranean whites, for a while, they were not really included in the category of Americans either, because they were not white enough. And so it, it tells you to what extent every nation constructs race in ways that are, uh, are pro convenient to them. And I think that the distinction between white and non-white in the United States became critical because from the beginning, there was encounters of uh, people of different races in modern terms of different, of, of different ethnic groups. And with the disposition of land from Native Americans, it really became necessary at some point to define the category of white in terms of entitlement to land and other rights that other people would be excluded from. And that's quite uh, useful to know. Then um, after I graduated um, um, from um, uh, the, uni the, the, the University of Chicago, I started working in Jamaica. And I had to learn to adjust the definition of black. And this was like the second time I had to do it. From home, the category of black didn't really exist because the colonizers referred to us as indigenous, indigenous people more properly identified now as natives. And I come to the United States, the people that wouldn't have counted as black counted as black. And then I arrived in Jamaica, the people that now I could identify as blacks protested that they were not blacks, they were brown people. So mm -hmm. it's a different kind of category. And to make things, my life more difficult, I arrived in South Africa, or oh, I had to deal with another category, colored people. Uh, which is still very difficult for me to tell with certainty who is colored and who is not colored, uh, because sometimes people of dark, some people of dark complexion fall in the category of colored people. So, uh, the, I, I think uh, what we have to remember is that race is historically grounded. Uh, depending on the political structure of the general socioeconomic structure and how people want to share power or entitlements and things like that. And my hunch is that the notion of race became so important in the United States, largely because the people that founded the United States were coming from a feudal system. And the feudalism was not based on race, it was based on rights of land and who was working for whom and things like that. So everywhere people find some ways of redefining the categories of discrimination and oppression and exploitation, whatever. That's really what I wanted to add. Well, that, that was a um, very rich set of comments. Um, I'm not going to uh, reply to all of it, but it did prompt um, a lot of ideas in my head as well. I would just reply to the last point. I think um, the colonization by feudal people is not uh, what I would first emphasize in terms of the importance of race in the Americas, rather the fact that um, the colonizers were very set to become capitalists that made race such a um, profitable category um, was something that played a role. That doesn't discount the feudal part. It uh, gives it, I think, a, a different role. 
And um, there was another point that I wanted to make that I'm that's slipping my mind right now. Um, well, maybe I can come back to it in the, in the next round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I remember. <laughs> May I just quickly? Um, because the um, the way that race is being constructed uh, in every context um, differently, I don't think is a way of constructing it anew every time, but that also the racial categories into which people are being pushed um, once they arrived in a territory very much have to do with the colonial genealogy of that territory. So Ramon Grossfogel has very interesting work on how um, being mistaken for an Algerian in France leads to a different kind of uh, racialization than if, um, so for a Puerto Rican, uh, gives his own example, going to France, if being perceived as Puerto Rican doesn't mean much because there is no colonial history between France and Puerto Rico. So you'd be seen as um, a US American maybe, uh, but being mistaken for an Algerian, although you have, you're the same person and have the same phenotype would lead to a very different treatment, a very different kind of discrimination. The same with um, kind of Surinamese in the Netherlands. Um, there is a clear and very recent still colonial connection between the, the Netherlands and Suriname. But um, if you're Surinamese in Romania, well, welcome from the Caribbean. So um, very um, precise and longstanding genealogies plays a, play a role in how even individual lenses, not just national lenses, are adjusted to see or to not see race and what race is seen. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Bogger. Um, professor, I'm going to the oh, I was just going to suggest, like, if you could put the reference that you just mentioned in the chat. Um, yeah, good. About yeah. Grossfog Grossfogel. <laughs> Thank you. Right. What I think we could do, Byron, is this. Um, why don't we um, allow Krishna or Kim to announce next week's speakers? Then we can stop recording and then you can go through the various questions in the chat box so that uh, we give um, other people who wanted to talk an opportunity to do so in the after party. All right. So Krishna and Kim, 